so in this lecture we will discuss about uh, how to find the time and space complexity of a recursive algorithm uh, suppose uh, there is a recursive program the recursion means that if a function calls itself a number of times it means it is a recursion if a function calls itself a number of times we'll say that this is the recursion so suppose you want to find out a factorial of a number when right? So uh, the factorial is actually defined by itself. For example, you can define a factorial by factorial n by n into factorial n minus one. So you can say that this factorial is defined by itself. So if you're trying to find out a factorial of five, so you can say that it is five into four factorial. Similarly, if you are finding the factorial four, you can say that it is four into factorial three. If you're finding a factorial three, it will be three into factorial two. Similarly, factorial two is two into factorial one. Factorial one is one into factorial zero. But you cannot reduce it further from zero. So this actually is the base condition, wherein you will say that uh, factorial zero is one. You know that the value of factorial zero is one. So factorial n is defined as n into factorial n minus one if n is greater than zero. Otherwise, it is one. It means if n is zero, you are finding out the zero factorial. That value is one. So you are defining factorial in its own terms. But since you are de decreasing this term every time, there is a limit up to which you can decrease it. The moment the limit condition comes, you will say that this is actually a base condition, and you will return a value directly there. So one into one factorial. Is given to factorial one. Two into one is given to here. You know the value of two factorial now. Six is given here. You know the value of uh, factorial three, which is six from here. So six into four, twenty-four. And you know the value of factorial four, twenty-four into five, one twenty is returned for this one. So this way you can uh, define a recursive function. That actually is defined its own, in known terms, and you know the base condition also. So a base condition is very important in the recursive function. Let's take another example. Suppose you have to compute a raised to the power b. So, uh, so let's say you don't have the power operation. In C also there is no power operation. The power is actually performed by the repeated multiplications. So you can say that a raised to the power b is a into A raised to the power b minus one. So you have defined the a raised to the power b in its own term. So a into a raised to the power b minus one. So if you have a raised to the power five, it is a into a raised to the power four. A raised to the power four is a raised to the uh, a into a raised to the power three. It is a into a square. It is a into a power one, and then a power one is a into a power zero. So this is the base condition. You cannot uh, reduce it further. You know that a raised to the power zero is one. Fine. Right? So the base condition is if b is is zero, then a raised to the power zero value will be one. And otherwise, <coughs> it will be a into a raised to the power b minus one. So you, since you know this value, it can be returned here. You know the value of this, it will be returned here. You know the value of this, it will be returned here. You know the value of this, it will be returned here. And finally, you know the value of this, so it will be returned here. So, for defining the recursive function, you you should actually reduce the uh, reduce the terms such that you need you reach to the base condition, and there is a proper value of the base already defined. Now, <clears throat> let's take another example to understand this. Suppose you have two values, let's say thirty-six and twenty-four. You want to find out the GCD of these two numbers. GCD means the greatest common divisor. In Hindi, you uh, it is actually known as Mahatam Samapvartak. So let's say this is A and this is B, and you want to find out the GCD of these two numbers. It is very simple to find out. You subtract the smaller terms from the bigger one, so 36 minus 24, it becomes 12. 
you again subtract the smaller term from the bigger term so 24 minus 12 it becomes 12 now if these two values are equal then either of these two is a GCD fine so let's say you're finding out the GCD of two numbers a and b so finding out the GCD of 36 and 24 is same as finding out the GCD of 12 and 24 and similarly finding out the GCD of 12 and 24 is same as finding out the GCD of 12 and 12. So what we are saying that GCD of A and B if A is greater than B is equal to GCD of A minus B and B. The condition which came here. So A was bigger so we have subtracted A from B, subtracted B from A and then we have found the GCD of A minus B and B. Fine. In case when B is greater than A, the condition here, we will subtract smaller term A from B and then we will find out the GCD of A and B minus A. And in case A and B are equal, the case here, either of these two is the GCD. So either A or B, this is the GCD. This is not division sign. This is actually A or B. This is the GCD. Fine. So here the base condition is when A and B becomes equal, this is the base condition. You can take another example to understand this. Let's say A and B values are, let's say this is 54 and let's say this is 91 <clears throat> let's say 93 you want to find out the GCD of these two numbers so this is greater than this one so you will perform this by this rule this will be 93 minus 54 so 93 minus 54 this is 39 so now A becomes greater than B, you will now find 54 minus 39, this becomes 15. And then again B becomes greater than A, so this you will perform 39 minus 15, which is 24. Again B is greater than A, so you will perform 24 minus 15, which is 9. And then A is greater than B, so you will perform 15 minus 9, which is 6. And then B is greater than A, so you will perform B minus A, so it becomes 3. And then A is greater than B, so you will perform A minus B. Now A and B becomes equals, so this is the GCD. Either A or B is the GCD. Now, suppose we are taking another example of uh, finding out a Fibonacci number. Right? The Fibonacci series. What happens in the Fibonacci series? First term is 0, next term is 1, next term is the addition of these two terms, next term is the addition of previous two terms that is 2, next term is 1 plus 2, 3, next term is 2 plus 3, 5, next term is 3 plus 5, 8, next term is 5 plus 8, 13, Next term is 8 plus 13, 21 and so on and so forth. So the next term is actually the sum of the previous two terms. So let's say we have to find out the nth Fibonacci number. So what is actually nth Fibonacci number? This is equals to, let's say we have to find this term. So this term is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, ninth term. So ninth term is actually the sum of sum of 7th and 8th term. Right? You can say that the Fibonacci term n is actually equals to sum of Fibonacci term n minus 1 and Fibonacci term n minus 2. But let's say you are finding the first term. So first term cannot be found by this, this formula. So the first term will be directly defined as 0. So if the value of n is 1 the term will be 0. Similarly, you cannot find the second term by this formula. So you will have to define this second term as a base condition. Let's say the value of n is 2. You will say that 
Fibonacci term is 1. But if the Fibonacci term is greater than 2, you will apply this formula. Fine. So Fibonacci term n is defined as Fibonacci term n minus 1 plus Fibonacci term n minus 2. And if the n value is 1, this is the base condition, you will return 1 directly. If n value is 2, you will return this 1 directly. Thank you.